Good morning. Man, if I, if I don't get you, if your blood pumping and your, your heart turned tor- towards God, I don't, I don't know what will. This morning we're going to be in the book of Hebrews. And it's like, man, we're getting Hebrews to death because we're doing Hebrews in Sunday school. And now we get a sermon from Hebrews. So that's all good. We're probably, as a matter of fact, we'll probably get to Hebrews 10. I hadn't looked in our Sunday school book, but we'll probably get there. So maybe whenever we get there, you'll be, have a little more background to it and be a little more prepared for it. But I'm taking a little different angle at this passage, I believe, today. God uh, laid it on my heart. I woke up with this verse uh, this week, and I said, well, I guess this is what, what we're going to talk about today. And I want to focus on us being all in for Jesus. So basically, this is, this is, a, this is a, a sermon about commitment. And if, and if you're honest, I would say that for most of us, we, trouble with, we have trouble with commitment. In, in the local church, we have trouble with commitment. Amen? And the people say, well, the problem with this generation is they're just not committed to anything. And I would beg to differ. I think that, that nobody has a problem with commitment. I think people have problems committing to the right things. Right, because we're willing to commit to you know lots of things. We, you know, if you want to play ball, then you commit to playing ball. You commit to hours and hours and hours of that. If you want to commit to being successful in your career, you'll commit hours and hours and hours to making whatever you need to do to make your career successful. If you're committed to education, you'll spend hours and hours and hours and years of study to to make sure that you get to a certain level of education. So we know that that the, the commitment's not the issue. the The real truth is that that we want to do our own thing. We all want to do our own thing, that sinful part of us. We want to do our own thing. We're, we're selfish and self-centered, right? If we're honest, I mean, we, we, we think life's all about us for the most part. And we tend to schedule everything around our Christian life, right? And when I say that, I mean, if we have any time left, then we'll do things uh, for the Lord. We'll, we'll, we'll schedule. If, if work permits, I'll be there. If my kids' uh, ball practice schedule permits, I'll be there. If my personal vacation permits, I'll be there, right? If it's like whatever time is left over in our week, then we're going to, if we have, if time permits, then we're going to do it, then we're going to serve the Lord that way. We'll be there. You know, we'll, we'll make excuses like, well, I would come to Sunday school, but you know, I work, I worked hard this week, and so I need extra sleep, you know. I mean, y'all, I mean, what's the big deal? It's just one hour, you know, I'll just, you know, what's the big deal? I just, you know, I don't see the importance of that, so... Uh, and then, you know, just keep on making excuses. So Sunday night, uh, no discipleship, right? I'm not going to be up. You want me to be at church at 5? You want me to be at 5? I've got to cut grass. You know, I've got to work again this week. I need to cut the grass. I need to go get groceries. Wednesday night, you forget that. Prayer meeting? I can pray, I can pray anywhere. Why do I need to go to church on Wednesday night? Why do I need to be there for that? My kids have practice. I've got to get my kids to practice. We can't be at prayer meeting, right? No mission trip. Can't go to mission trip. We need to go to Disney World for the third time this year. All right? I'm kind of laid on a little thick, but y'all get my point. All right? We can all make excuses about why we're not in church. We can all make excuses about why we don't do things for the Lord. We all can come up with a number of things. The truth is we're going to do what we want to do. Especially if you're, if you're a grown-up, you're an adult, right? You're going to do what you want to do. Children, you don't have that leeway. You know, the children kind of go, uh, especially to get to church. It, it takes an adult to get you here. I understand that. And sometimes with parents, you know, if parents don't come, the kids won't come. I understand all those things. But it's about commitment. So, with the lack of commitment that we see in our own lives and across the board, is it any wonder that we see so many churches that are sickly, on the decline, or dying, or dead? Right? Is it any wonder? I would say it's not. And a, a good analogy, I guess, I can use that for if you're married, you'd understand. And if you're not married, I hope that one day you will understand. Our Christianity is a lot like a marriage. It really is. It takes time together to make it grow and to flourish. You have to invest in it, you know, your marriage, that relationships. You know, uh, you know, I want to spend time with my wife, and, and my wife wants to spend time with me. Right? Hopefully that, that's, that can be said for you if, in your marriage. Right? My wife loves me, encourages me, comforts me, teaches me, serves with me, rebukes me, and corrects me. Right? I need that. You know, I, we all need that. Right? We do. It's the same way with the body of Christ. We all need each other. And the Bible verifies that. There are dozens of exhortations in the New Testament alone that's talking about one another. Love one another, bear, uh, bear with one another, 
pray for one another on and on. And here's the key of the whole thing. You can't one another if you never spend time with one another. Right? You can't, you can't, you can't one another one another if you're never around one another. If you never spend time with one another. I come up with this uh, this week I, as I was preparing. Just think about this way. For a Christian choosing to not spend time with other Christians is as odd and unhealthy as a husband choosing not to spend time with his wife. Something is definitely wrong with that relationship. Is that true or false? Right. Right. So, so when we make up these excuses and, you know, why we're not there, why don't we be a part of anything, it kind of points to a bigger problem. Something's wrong. For marriages to be everything they should be, we have to go all in. Right. All in. All in. No, no holding back. For our Christian life to be everything it should be, we have to go all in. Every bit, every bit of it, everything we have, all of our time, our, our efforts. So, uh, it, I guess a good analogy of being all in. I thought this. Was, I've heard this before, and I hope I get it right, so I don't mess it up. Because it's really a good analogy, and I'd hate to mess it up. The difference between being all in and just being kind of involved is the difference between a, a pig and a chicken and a, and a, uh, a, a egg and bacon breakfast. Right, the pig went all in. Right, to make bacon, that pig had to go all in for for the for the chicken. He just he just had to be involved in it, right? Right. So I'm looking. I guess if you want to boil it down, the church we're looking for some pigs. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for some folks, some folks to be all in. That's what we're looking for to be effective, to be the church that God would have us to be. Just a little background on our on our letter uh, to the Hebrews. You know, if you've done Sunday school, the uh, the, the church, the, the people that this letter has been written to were under tremendous persecution, right? Tremendous persecution. And, and the, natural, the natural response to being persecuted is to, be, is to, is to pull back, right? When, we, when, we, when we're experiencing pain, don't we tend to want to withdraw? We tend to, to, to back up a little bit or, from the, or back away from the heat. And what it was is that their association with other Christians made them targets. And so when you want to gather together, it's easy. Whenever everybody's gathering, if the, the, the persecutors want to find the, the Christians, where should they look? The churches, right? Where the people are gathering, right? The gathering places where they're at. So that's what was happening. So people were beginning to withdraw. Uh, they'd isolate themselves from other believers to protect themselves, right? It makes sense. In the flesh, that makes sense. They wanted to keep their jobs, wanted to keep their friends, maintain their relationships, all these things with their families. And, and most of all, they wanted to keep their health, right? They, they weren't real big on, on suffering for the gospel's sake. But we have to remember this, that Christ is our hope and our refuge, right? Christ is our hope. You know, and where, where we find that in his, in his word, we find it in his church with God's people. That's where we find these things. It's Christ's body. We are the body of Christ. So do you really think that you're better off apart from the body of Christ? Do you really think that you're, you're safer? Do you really think you function better? Do you really think you have a better chance apart from the body of Christ as believers? Do you really think that you're strong enough on your own to do your own thing apart from the support of the church and have a healthy Christian life? Do you really think that? You really, you've really drank that Kool-Aid to think that you can do that? I beg to differ. We're all called to go in, to go all in for Christ. Let's look at our passage. Verses 23 uh, to 25, the 10th chapter of Hebrews. It says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who, has pro- who promised is faithful, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is a manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more, uh, uh, much more as you see the day approaching. So the first thing that we see from our passage in verse 23 is that we can go all in for Jesus by holding fast to our confession. Right? Holding fast to our confession. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And it says there that we hold fast without wavering. You know what it means to, to, to not waver, right? To, to, to be strong, to not go back and forth, to, to kind of to stand strong. It means to persevere. And here's the truth is that, that many reveal their true spiritual condition by not holding fast. Right? That they don't hold fast. If you look around... Uh, I, was, I was sharing some men this week, and I think about not this church, but just churches in general. When you have an annual report uh, that, that you're turned into the uh, the convention, 
of baptisms. And you'll see these numbers. You know, you'll see 15 baptisms a year, one year, and 12 the next year, and 20 the next year. And then you visit that church, and you, you're expecting to see 20, 30, you know, 40 like young people that have been baptized, and you, and you show up, like, where are they at? Apparently, they're not holding fast. If they were holding fast, they'd be here. The, 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 the congregation w- would be swelling and growing. But apparently, something's gone wrong. Something has gone amiss there. They tend to make professions, get pep- baptized, and then you never see them again. Right? We've all seen that. It's sad. First John speaks to this, to, to, talks about that, the people that make professions and then kind of fade away. And First John uh, 2.19 says this, so they, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that, they, that, that uh, none of them were of us. When you look around, when you, when you see the ones that once were here that aren't anywhere anymore, don't make excuses. You know why they're not here? You know why they're not in church anywhere? Because they're not one of us. Right? True believers are going to be in church. True believers are going to be a part of the body of Christ. True believers are going to be associated with a local body. Right? Holding fast, uh, make this clear, holding fast does not keep us saved, but it gives evidence that we are saved. Does that make sense? It doesn't keep us holding fast. It ain't, it's not in our power, but, but, but by us holding fast, it gives evidence that we are saved, that we're here. We also see here that, that we hold fast by abiding in Christ. Right? The scripture speaks about this, abiding in Christ. In John 8, 31 says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. You see the connection. There's connection with with uh, you know, being who you say you are, with, with the, the, the two going together. It says, you're my disciples indeed, if you abide in my word. Right? If you abide in my word. Abiding in Christ gives evidence that we're saved. Right? Abiding in his word gives evidence that we're saved. We also, we hold fast by enduring in Christ. Right? That's another way we do it. We hold fast by endure, enduring in Christ. And we've got several verses here. Uh, that speak to this. Uh, Matthew twenty four thirteen says, But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Right? To the end. To the end. Not, not just start well, but finish as well. Mark thirteen thirteen, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. All right? Y'all see the repetition? See how this is going along? This isn't about starting. This is about finishing. This isn't about making a profession and then you're done. This is about lasting. This is about making it all the way to the finish line to your last day. And then Hebrews three fourteen says, For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm. There it is again, to the end. To the end. It's about lasting. Enduring in Christ give evidence uh, that we are saved. So it, like in all things, and especially in Christianity, it's not how we start, but how we finish that matters. Right? A lot of people start strong. Not many persevere. Not many make it all the way to the end. We've got lots of people that are big up front and get excited about what's going on in their life and then with the church. But as time wears on, they tend to drift away and fade out. And of course, this is all driven by this, this last one. It says, we can hold fast because God is faithful. Right? That's the driving force behind all of this. this. This isn't about you pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and, and just, just sucking it up and, and, and white knuckling your faith. This is about God's faithfulness. Uh, our ability to hold fast is rooted in our strength, not in our own strength, but in God's promises. That's how we're able to hold fast. God keeps his word. Right? He's not a liar. He's not a man. First Thessalonians five twenty three and 24 says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here it is, verse 24. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Right? That's how we hold fast. That God will do this work in us. And in regards to our faithfulness, uh, hanging on there, uh, John MacArthur said this. It says, God's answer uh, may seem to be a long time in coming, 
and our waiting may be uncomfortable or even painful, but he will always do just as he has said he will do. Right? He'll do it. If he said he'll do it. He's not, he's not a, you know, a man that he should lie. He's not you know, somebody who has a good intentions like we are because we are often that way, right? Don't we have good intentions? We, we mean to do certain things, but just circumstances come along and we're not able to do what we said we'd do. Right? We're not able to keep our word. God is not like that. Uh, God will do exactly what he would say he would do. He is faithful. In re- regards to us and our hope and our faith, a lot of us, we like to talk a big game. We talk about how strong our faith is and how much we love Jesus, right? We talk to people and we share that. Uh, there once was a, a tightrope walker uh, that would do a trick and, and do his uh, perform over Niagara Falls. Uh, he would do a tightrope uh, act, I guess, or whatever. You, I don't know what you would call it. But he would, he would get up on that tightrope and he'd make his way across, you know, and he'll do his little thing. He'll, you know, do his balancing act and he'd, you know, stumble and almost fall and the crowd would gasp and this and that. But he'd gather his balance again and work his way across. And the, and the crowd would cheer and they would, man, this guy's great, man. We, and that's awesome. And they said, you know, he, he'd call for a volunteer. He's like, it's one thing for me to cross this line on my own, he says, but if you really believe I can do it and you have faith in me, then I need a volunteer from the crowd to come and ride on my shoulders. Right? Any takers. Right? Not, not so secure after that, right? Not, not quite so confident whenever it involves you uh, when you want to get uh, on his shoulders and go back across. You know, that confidence tends to fade uh, when he asks for the volunteers. That's the way we are, we are sometimes in our faith with Jesus, that we, we will talk the talk until it comes time to walk the walk. Right? We lose confidence. We talk confidently, and then whenever challenges come, we back away whenever it's actually put to the test. But we can go all in by holding fast to our hope in Jesus. Right? That's what going all in is all about. Second thing we see in verse 24, we can go all in for Jesus by thinking of others first. Right? And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. What a noble concept, huh? What a, what a, what a way to, to, to think about things is to think of others first. To to set your your wants, your needs, your desires to the side and surrender to the needs of others. Take the focus off of you and focus on others. In a positive way for a change. When we tend to focus on others, we tend to focus on the negative, right? When when we focus on others, we, we tend to notice what's wrong instead of what's right. This is not talking about that. This is putting the focus on in a positive way. Because here's what drives that. A lot of times we get self-absorbed. Going back to that whole idea of self. We're always thinking about us and, and what, what I need and what I uh, want to have done. It says here in this, in this verse 24 that we're to stir one another up to love. Right? You've got to stir that up. It doesn't, it doesn't just happen automatically. Y'all know that? that it, has, it takes work. It takes work and, 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 and a desire to want to love one another. And this is the opposite of being critical and judgmental. You know, stir one another up to love and not being critical or judgmental. That's, that's for us. We struggle with that. I struggle with that. I struggle with being critical. It's, it's sometimes it's hard for me to see the good in things, but it's easy to see the wrong in things and the bad in things. So this is just the opposite of that. It's a, it's a call to encourage one another, not tear one another down. Right? Look for opportunities. Instead of dwelling on what's going wrong, emphasize what's going right. Right. Can't we do that? Don't we get sometimes overwhelmed with, with, with our circumstances and all we, can, all we can see is what's wrong and not what's right? Focus on those things. Look for the victory. Celebrate the small things. Look for opportunities to, to pay a compliment. Right? To pay a compliment. Just, you never know whose day you're going to make by making a, now, be clear, a sincere compliment. People, people know when you're not being sincere. Right? But a sincere compliment can go a long ways. And be sure to acknowledge someone's efforts, uh, no matter how large or small. Right? Acknowledge someone's effort. You know, encourage them. That makes a big deal. No, no telling when somebody's just about ready to quit, and then somebody comes along and says a kind word, and say, man, look, I really appreciated the way you led Bible study today. You really did a, I really think you have a gift for that. Or I really appreciate the way you stepped out and, and, and led worship or song, uh, uh, the song service today. I really appreciate the way you take care of the children. You know, you really have a gift to work with the kids. And all these things uh, are, are stirring one another up to love. And, and it's a hallmark. Love is a hallmark of believers. Look at John uh, 13, 34 to 35. 
It says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, all know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. It's a trademark. If you're looking at a, or a hallmark of Christianity, it's love. It's loving one another. It's different. When we love one another, others take notice. Y'all notice that? When, when, when people see that in, in a workplace, if you work with other believers in the way you care for one another and the way you love one another and the way you treat one another, people take notice of that. They will take notice of that. But you know what else they'll take notice of? When you don't love one another. Right? When you don't love one another, when you're mean to one another, hateful to one another. People want to be part of a loving environment, right? Don't you? Don't you want to be part of a loving environment? Nobody wants to be part of, of, of a negative, you know, group of people. I hope you don't. You don't want to be a part of that. You're looking for a loving environment. And so what a blessing it can be to in a, be in a place where uh, you can love, in a place where you can be loved, right? That's the church. That should describe us. And love is contagious. It is contagious, you know, just like negativity, love is contagious as well. When people start treating one another kind, it's contagious. Just like it is when you're negative, when negativity tends to spread as well. It also speaks of, uh, in, this, in this verse, we're reminded that we're to stir one another up to good works. Right? Stir one another up to good works. Uh, encouragement uh, uh, others. You know, encourage others to serve with you. Now, this takes a little bit of patience on your part. You know, a lot, a lot of times whenever you're gifted in a certain area and you take on a disciple, you take on a, 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 you know, a mentor-mentee relationship, sometimes this is going to cause you a little, uh, going to test your patience a little bit. But what you're doing is, is you're uh, equipping someone else to be able to serve alongside you. you know, you're equipping them to be able to, to uh, uh, serve in a new way, and you're just creating opportunities. Right, because sometimes I, I, as a pastor, I, I know that we kind of get, you know, we, we push that, you know, serve and we need volunteers for this. It's the, I mean, the, the church requires people to work. Y'all know that. So, you know, so, some people don't realize that. Some people just think you, you just come and you sit in the, in the pews and then you go home and everything else happens by itself, like there's fairies that that work in the church. That everything happens by fairies, and there are no fairies in the church. It takes people. It takes people to make things happen there. It takes people to, to get the air on. It takes people uh, to clean up after service. It takes people to teach Sunday school lessons. It takes people to work in the nursery. It takes people to do cut grass. It takes people to do fall festival, right? All these things. So we create opportunities. We stir one another up to good works. And here's another, another truth. The best way to stop being selfish is to serve others, Right? That, that's a good way to break that habit, is by serving others. Um, like love, selflessly serving others sets Christianity apart, because that's not what the world does. Right? If the world typically does, up, does something, it's to get something. Right? It's the, oh, you scratch, you know, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Christianity is not like that, that we serve uh, out of love, it's not expecting anything in return. Right? It's not, not giving to get. It's what Jesus did. Right? That's how he served. He didn't do anything to be noticed, but he did it out of love. Look at Mark 10.45. It says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Right? Jesus didn't come and say, Serve me, do for me, give me, do this my way. Right? I like it this way, so make sure and cater to me. Jesus said he came to serve. He didn't come to be served, and that's what we're made for. You know, we're made for service. That's where, in Ephesians 2.10, it speaks to that. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Right? We're created for service. We're created for good works. That's what we're here for. Right? And so I, I just know that just from past experience in my own life in, in, the, in the church world, that once you serve, once you get involved, just for example, like for VBS, you may have had somebody that for a long time would say that I just don't feel led to, to, to serve in, in vacation Bible school. I just don't. I just, that's a lot of work and a lot of time, and I just, I just can't. And then that person finally will serve one year. And I've never heard out one time anybody say, man, I really shouldn't have done that. I really regret serving in vacation Bible school. Man, that just was just a waste of my time. I've never not once heard somebody say that. All right? 
It's like somebody that, that finally will go on a mission trip and say, man, and they get back from that mission trip and say, man, I really regret doing that. I could, have spent, I could have spent that week doing something else. I should have went fishing for a week. Right? I've never heard anybody say that. Right? Good works is what we're made for. We demonstrate Christ towards others by, uh, through love and good works. That's the point. So we can go all in by thinking of others first. And the last thing we see in our passage this morning is that we can go all in for Jesus by meeting sacrificially. This, this is the one that's probably going to rub a lot of y'all the wrong way, but, uh, you know, it, the word says what the word says. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more uh, as you see the day approaching. All right, we all know that. This is, you know, this is talking about what we're doing this morning. This is talking about what we do on Wednesday nights. This is talking about what we do in, in ladies' meetings. This is what we do uh, gathering as a men for uh, uh, prayer breakfast or whatever it is that gathering together. And we know that meeting together takes time. Right? We all have the same 24 hours a day to use. We know that. You know, that, that, you know if you're still at the age where you work, you're not retired, you, got a, you have a job. If you have family, you have kids, you have a, a spouse. Right? All these things take time. And we know also that gathering with the church takes time. Everything takes time. So what it boils down to is a question of priorities. All right? That's what it boils down to. Is, is, your, is your church family, is following Christ a priority for you or not? That's what it boils down to. You know? where, where do the church-related activities rank in your book? All right? Where is it at? If you, if you get a little list out and you say, you know, job, you know, this is no order. You, you, the, the players, right? Job families, uh, extracurricular activities, children's events, right, church activities. That's kind of the way it falls, right? That all those go first and whatever's left. We have time left over. That, like anything related to the church is usually on the bottom. And if we need more time, what gets bumped out of the schedule? Church, right? If, if, I, if, I, if I've overloaded my plate, what usually gets kicked off the schedule? Church, right? That's what gets pushed to the wayside. Not, not ball games, Right? Not, not, not practice, not working extra shifts. Church is what gets shoved to the side. Anything related with church gets pushed off to the sides. So what it boils down to is apparently some people have decided that gathering with other believers just isn't that important. Right? That's what happened in that day. That's what was going on back in the day when this letter was written originally. And apparently that's what happens today as well. Just that mindset, well, it's just not that important. I, I don't know what's going on up there that, that they need to meet all the time. I just don't, you know, I just don't get it. I, I don't feel I need to be there. It's just not that important. Well, here's the truth, that we meet for a purpose. Y'all know that? We don't, we don't just open these doors and come up here just because we have nothing better to do. Because we all know we can find a thousand and one other things we could do. If, if we're just trying to kill time, we could find plenty of other things to do than come up here and do it. Trust me. We meet for a purpose. It says that we meet to exhort one another. That's what it says in this passage there. We encourage one another. Right? We need encouragement. Life is hard, isn't it? You know, it's, it's not no bed of roses. I don't know what, what, what you expect out of life, but life is tough. And, and hard things happen. Difficulties come. You know, life isn't like we thought it was going to be. Sicknesses arise. Death comes. Financial crisis. Where are you going to find encouragement in that? Where are you going to find help in that? All right? The body of Christ. We support one another in the good times and bad. We support one another. We, we, we mourn together and we celebrate together. That's what we do. As a, like a family, that's what we do. We serve in that way. We teach one another when we gather. We teach one another God's word. Right? Sunday school, ladies' Bible study, men's Bible study, discipleship time, the preaching hour. Right? We teach one another. And also not just, not just through the word, but also through life experience. You know, older men with younger men and older ladies with, with younger ladies sharing life, life's wisdom, life experience. We share these things. We teach one another. Also, probably the greatest one of all is that we remind one another of our hope that's in Christ. When we get overwhelmed by the world and we see that the, the days are dark and the troubles they seem to keep piling up, we remind one another that He's coming back. Right? He is coming back. That this isn't just going to go on and on and on and on. We may not see it. In our day, but he is coming back. 
Right? He's coming back for his church. Also, here's another, the, the, the last thing we're going to look at is that we, we should meet more and not less. Really don't like that one, huh? Part, part-time churchgoers don't like to hear that. Wait a second. I, I struggle to get here once a week or once a month. And you're saying meet more, not less? Well, sure, it makes sense because the, the, today the trend is to meet less. Uh, Brother Kelly, he, he, uh, <laughs> we had fun at my ordination. We was talking to one of the pastors of another, another church in the area, and uh, he wasn't going to be there for Sunday evening. He was there for my ordination, and he said, uh, he asked him, so well, who's preaching in your service? And he said, we don't have Sunday evening services anymore. And Brother Kelly said, well, shame on you. <laughs> he, he, said, he said, yeah, he said, he said shame on you. But, uh, but that's the truth. A lot of churches are doing away with Sunday evening services. A lot of churches have done away with midweek services, right? Everything is geared towards that, just the Sunday morning experience, right? That's it. Once a week, you know. And look, I don't want to make all the focus is on this. You know, this is great, and this is right, and this is biblical. But when, we, when we're talking about gathering together and meeting together, we're also talking about in our homes, right? Sharing life together. Not, not just this. But also in small groups, you know, having dinner together, you know, uh, doing service projects together, all those things. Not, not just this. Don't just focus on this. Right? All these things are important that we do all these things together. So uh, separating one another or, or not meeting together, especially in, in this day that we live in, right? Is, is our country and, and this world we live in, y'all watch the news? Are things getting better or getting worse? <laughs> seems to be getting worse, doesn't it? Doesn't it seem to be getting darker? And that's what it's talking about here in our, in our verse. It says to, uh, to, to meet, it says, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Because the Bible talks about that as things get worse and worse. The day is growing near. Right? We need to be encouraged. It's not the smartest thing to, to do as far as staying apart in the, of our, in, the, in the state of our country is to be separated from one another. The darker it gets, the more we need each other. Right? The darker it gets, the more we need each other. The more that, that, that persecution arises, the more we need each other. Because right? it's easy to quit. Right? When, you feel there's no, when you lose hope, it's easy to quit. It's easy to fall apart and fall away and to drift off. We need one another. Look at this, this, I'm going to close with this last quote from John MacArthur. I think it kind of sums it all up. It wraps it up in a nice little bow. It says, The only place where we can remain steadfast until he returns is with his people. We need each other. We need to be in fellowship with each other as we mutually strengthen each other and encourage each other. That's John MacArthur said that. Right. So where are you at this morning? Are you, are you, if, you, if you were to like, be honest with yourself and evaluate where you are spiritually, are you kind of a part-timer? Are you a Johnny-come-lately? You know, do, you, do you participate just on a whim of just like whether, you know, if I don't have nothing else to do, I'll show up, right? That's not going to cut it. Your, your faith is struggling. You, you have to be struggling if you're honest with yourself. You'd say that my, my faith walk is kind of shallow and superficial. It's probably because you're not all in, right? You're not committing as you should, right? You're holding fast. Are you holding fast to your confession, right? You've You've made your confession. You've professed Jesus as Lord, and are you living that way? Right. Are you surrendered to his lordship to follow him? Do you think of others first? Right. Or is everything always about you? Right. The, the schedule, the, the, the calendar, right? the, the finances all are, are wrapped around you and what you want. Or do you think of others first? And then the last one is, that are you meeting sacrificially? Right. Like I've said, I know we all we're all busy, man. We're 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 so busy nowadays. But are you taking time? Are you willing to sacrifice and lay down some of your personal desires, your wants, and your needs to meet with the body of Christ, to be encouraged, not just to not just to be encouraged, but to be an encouragement to others, right? I, I know I can speak for myself. Whenever there's an event uh, like a ladies' meeting, there's nothing more encouraging than to see a house full of women that show up because they have other things to do. Right, it's 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 usually on a, a work night. It's a week night, so the women have other things to do. But to go there and see a household women that want to meet one another and love on one another, and encourage one another, what a great thing! The the, the breakfast yesterday morning. Right, I'm I'm not 
I'm not big on rising at six o'clock to, to do anything. Right? I just I'm just being honest. But to be there, to be with those men, to see you know fourteen, fifteen men to get up that early and come up here just to encourage one another, not just to eat food, but but to sh- just to encourage one another, to be in one another's presence, to to hear a, a, a devotion, you know, God's word. That's encouraging. It takes sacrifice. So are you willing to meet sacrificially? Because here's the truth. You'll never be the disciple that you should be until you go all in. All right? You won't. When we think about this in big picture terms, we'll, we will never be occupied too. We'll never be the church that we should be until we go all in. All of us. So let's commit this morning to go all in for Jesus. Let's pray. And then we'll have a moment of invitation. Father, forgive us for our lack of commitment. Forgive us, Father, for our our divided hearts. Father, forgive us uh, where we uh, place our own wants and needs uh, above yours and and above above your church, God. And, Father, we thank you that we have uh, such a a great example in our Lord and Savior Jesus. So as we look in his word, as we see that he came not to be served but to serve. So, Father, give us that same heart. Father, give us that same desire to, to, to be like Christ, Father. Help us to, to rearrange our schedules, Father, to, to make uh, your work our priority, Father. Lord, help us to, to, to remove that, that self-centeredness, that, that sin of, of pride, and, Father, that, that we would be people that are uh, looking to serve others first instead of ourselves, God. Father, help us to always remind it of our confession, Father, that, that you indeed are our Lord, Father, and that our life would reflect it. God, I pray this morning that, that those that have heard this, uh, this word, uh, this call to be all in, Father, for those that don't even know you this morning, that, that they would be reminded that uh, it starts for them just to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior this morning, Father. They can't go all in without Jesus. So, Father, I pray that you would do a work this morning in, in each one of us, Father, as we leave this place today, God. Help us to be bold to do whatever you've called us to do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.